Hello everyone, prize winners, friends, families, and supporters, and welcome to the 2020 Island Literary Awards. My name is Mo Duffy Cobb, and I'm on the executive with the PEI Writers Guild. Tonight, I'm joined by Christine Gordon Manley, Vice President of the PEIWG. Hi everybody. And Mark Belfry, fellow board member. Good evening, everyone. And together we'll be co-hosting this online awards gala. The awards are in their 33 years of celebrating individuals for their writing contributions to the island literary community. Sharing this experience together year after year has not only been made possible by those who submit their writing to the award ceremony, but also by those who avidly write, listen, and immerse themselves in our island literary culture. Thank you to all those who are tuning in to watch this broadcast and to all those out there who support the writing community every day. As you know, the, IL the ILAs and the PEI Writers Guild play an important role in fostering the culture of writing on PEI. So this is a very special celebration for all of those involved in the island literary community. Thanks for being here with us. It's with real gratitude that we recognize our award category title sponsors, the heirs of Ellen Montgomery, Confederation Court, Mall Merchants Association, Maritime Electric, Acorn Press, and The Bookmark. We also acknowledge the support of Silver Orange, Richard Lem and Leah Ellen Potty, the City of Charlottetown, Red Magazine, Tom Campbell, the PEI Literacy Alliance, Patty Larson, Manly Mann, Provincial Credit Union, Upstreet Craft Brewing, and Lori Brinklow. A very huge thank you to our many community sponsors that have helped make the 2020 Island Literary Awards possible. Arisia Dewidiak, Joel Gillespie, Julie Ann McKinnon-Gillian, Michael and Wendy Drake, Oliver Batchilder, Jay's Plumbing and Heating, as well as KKP for printing our programs and certificates for this awards gala. So we're soon gonna start handing out the hardware and I'd like to thank everybody who sent in a submission. These awards inspire Islanders of all ages to share their voices and contribute to PEI's literary landscape. All of the prize winners will receive a certificate and all first, second and third prize winners will receive a check thanks to our many award sponsors. If your work was nominated for an Island Literary Award but you do not hear your name announced in the prize categories, that means you've received an honorable mention and your certificate along with a copy of the official program will be mailed to you after the ceremony. We also have a special treat for you during this virtual awards gala as you'll get to hear some of our authors read short excerpts from their winning entries. Before we start, here's a short video on behalf of Honorable Brad Trivers, Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. Hi, I'm just so excited to uh, um, recognize the Island Literary Awards, of course, uh, worked on and, and offered through the PEI Writers Guild. So important to, uh, to recognize literacy and, and the work of people of all ages in this category uh, across our province. So congratulations to the 2020 winners of the Island Literary Awards. Our jurors help make this event happen as they have the extremely hard task of a adjudicating all the entries and putting forward their recommendations. When we asked one of our jurors what they enjoy, here's what Teresa Muse had to say. Hi everyone, my name is Teresa Muse and I love reading a story that keeps me wanting more. Being a jury for the Island Literacy Award did exactly that. It was fun and exciting to be part of this wonderful event and congratulations to all the nominees. Never stop writing. Now, the Confederation Court Mall Merchants Association Poetry Awards. The PEI Writers Guild is pleased to have the Confederation Court Mall Merchants Association as the title sponsor for the Poetry Awards. The Confederation Court Mall Merchants Association Poetry Award nominees are Emily Browning for I Paint My Nails Bright Red, Emily Can for Postgrad, Kelly Kieran Sampson for All About Me, Megan Gallant, for Should Have Loved Her, and Nick Van Rekirk for Connections. Third prize, sponsored by Acorn Press, goes to Emily Can for Postgrad. 
Here's what the jury's, jurors had to say about postgrad. Strong writing, both the accent and the name are, the accident and the name are great work, both very visual in delivery. Second prize, sponsored by Richard, by Richard Lem and Lee Ellen Potty, goes to Kelly Kieran Sampson for All About Me. The jury's comments, great collection of belonging, seeking, and nostalgia. School art has a very strong ending. And first prize, sponsored by Silver Orange goes to Emily Browning for I Paint My Nails Bright Red. Thoughts from our jurors, they said strong, unapologetic, honest. Brings the reader both visually, in the moment, and along for the story. Congratulations, Emily. And now here's Emily reading I Paint My Nails Bright Red. I paint my nails bright red. I paint my nails bright red so they know what kind of woman I am, so they know I can get myself off, light my own cigarettes, and open a thousand goddamn jars of pickles and eat them all. In the shower, I sing loudly to no one at all, not flinching when I nick my knee. Red dribbles down and makes love to the drain. Jars of specialty soaps line the tub's rim, woman-scented. It's not ladylike to smell of cigarettes. I scrub harder, my skin peels off. They tell me to take my clothes off, replace them with a paper gown. I need plan B is all. They ask my medical history. Do I smoke cigarettes? Am I on birth control? Am I still seeing red? It's too late. I've showered. A woman scrapes beneath my fingernails, placing the samples into jars. They reflect the fluorescent light, those jars that hold the pieces of me that tore off, pieces of him when he called me woman like it was an insult, and told me all that I owed him because I painted red roses on our headboard to cover burns from his cigarettes. My fingers itched to hold on to something, just a cigarette, something small, unsuspecting my mother's jam jars or her hand. She would have told me not to wear red because it's a color too easy to rip off, draws too much attention to all the wrong places, worn only by a certain kind of woman. She knows because she was a woman who wore it on her lips, so it stained her cigarettes and the back of my father's hand when he would push all of him onto all of her and apologize with cheap jars of perfume, so fragrant they never wore off. She would have told me I knew better than to wear red. I am a woman inside tiny jars, stinking of cigarettes and parts of him I can't wash off, biting my fingers, all the nail polish chips, bright red. Now the uh, Heirs of Ella Montgomery Literature Award, or Literature for Children Awards. This category is named after Prince Edward Island's beloved Lucy Maud Montgomery. Uh, and the nominees for the L.M. Montgomery Literature, for, uh, sorry, for the Heirs of Ella Montgomery Literature for Children Awards are Eric Leamont for Jumping Jimmy Johnson, Gretha Rose for Hope, Hannah Stiff for The Peasant Princess, Ian Stretch for Scrappy, and Jessica Much for Mr. Tuttles and the Missing Biscuits. Now third prize, sponsored by Manly Man, goes to Eric Lemont for Jumping Jimmy Johnson. Here are the judges' comments. This story rushes along and there is a sense of energy for the reader. There are particular parts that capture a liveliness, such as Larry the Lasso, and the conversation as they try to capture Jimmy. Second prize, sponsored by Patty Larson, goes to Ian Stretch for Scrappy. The judges' comments. The farmyard setting and the idea of families of cats to illustrate both a rural way of life and ideas of power, fairness, and kindness opens up many possibilities. And the first prize for the Heirs of Ella Montgomery Literature for Children Awards, sponsored by the PEI Literacy Alliance, goes to Hannah Stiff. The Peasant Princess. And here's what the judges had to say. A lively story that attempts to take fairy tale stereotypes and shake them up. There is potential to take that idea further while being careful not to be caught in stereotypes yourself. This story has lots of energy and would be worth taking further. Congratulations, Hannah. And now here's Hannah herself reading an excerpt from The Peasant Princess. So began a very new, very hard life for a princess and her family. Every morning, Joanna rose up early, milked Jewel as she called her cow, helped her siblings make breakfast using Jewel's milk, and traveled into the village with her 12-year-old brother in search of work. 
The townspeople at first were wary of welcoming the newcomers and gave Joanna and her brother the worst jobs of hauling water and chopping wood. Payment came in the form of wilted cabbages or scrawny chickens. But slowly, as Johanna's hands bled, blistered, and hardened, and her cheeks burned, then browned, the village began to love and respect her and her young siblings as children most likely orphaned and left alone in the world. Indeed, though the princess and her family soon learned the language of the farmers, they never told their sad story of who they really were. Gone were their robes, gowns, and tunics. Joanna plowed fields in a woolen dress and bare feet. Her three youngest siblings attended the grammar school in town and played with farmers' children who would have bowed and awed them only a year ago. Her oldest brother commanded a herd of sheep instead of an army of soldiers. Evan's own son, an amiable young man with broad shoulders and big feet, asked for Johanna's hand in marriage, provided that she bring her cow to her new home. Joanna smiled kindly, shook her head, and later that evening laughed heartily over the incident with her siblings. But that night, when she was sure the others were asleep, Joanna lit a candle and went out to where a stream whispered its way around the cottage. She looked at her rippling reflection, now liberally dotted over with freckles. She pushed back a strand of hair and saw a large welt on her forefinger where a spade handle had worn her skin raw. She then returned to the cottage, lay down, and thought of David while her tears slowly came down for the first time in months. Joanna was strong, but sometimes even the strongest people feel wary. Mm, very moving. Mm. EI Writers Guild is pleased to have Maritime Electric as the title sponsor of the Short Story Awards. And the nominees are Chris Wilson for The Weight of a Flower, Jennifer Platts Fanning for Four Thieves Vinegar, and Katie McDonald for Walk Me Out. Third prize, sponsored by Tom Campbell, goes to Jennifer Platts Fanning for Four Thieves Vinegar. Here's what the jurors had to say. A fantastic story of death and obsession, Four Thieves Vinegar hones in on people's desperation in times of extremes, painting a dark setting where the moon shines as a bright eye over the night. With intense colloquial dialogue, the story follows a band of scoundrels pillaging bodies for not only jewelry, but for a mysterious book of spells, creating a curious tension that builds towards the finale. Four Thieves Vinegar might read like a twisted fairy tale with birds beaked, packed with herbs and false wooden eyes, but it also carries with it a humor that keeps the story teetering between light and dark. Second prize, sponsored by Red Magazine, goes to Katie McDonald for Walk Me Out. And here the judges said, Walk Me Out opens with a car swerving on ice, setting the wintry, noirish tone for the remainder of this vivacious tale. Its smart, punchy dialogue only builds on the keen depiction of its characters and urban surroundings, of tearing open cigarette packs with teeth, mobsters doubling as snowplow operators, fleet attacks, and tweakers around every corner, and the warm insides of waiting trucks. Walk Me Out swivels with surprising turns to the very end with a point of view shift that packs a wallop. Now first prize, sponsored by the city of Charlottetown, goes to Chris Wilson for The Weight of a Flower. Um, thoughts from our jurors. On the surface, The Weight of a Flower presents as an example of precision, exceptional dialogue, perfect pacing, strong characters, and enough sensory details to hear, smell, and taste the world of the kitchen in which, in which Faye passes her days. However, the story carries with it a complicated undercurrent beyond its sturdy plot, that of an inner landscape of its protagonist, both worrier and careful dreamer, as she is swept up in a conspiracy beyond her control. Like in all exceptional stories, the weight of a flower's beauty lingers just outside its mechanical elements, an experience in as much like poetry as prose. Congratulations, Chris. And now here's Chris himself reading an excerpt from The Weight of a Flower. On the third day, she found herself working alongside one of General Chin's men, a man whose hands looked too soft for a servant. He gave her a sidelong glance. Do you like your life, he asked. What do you mean, she asked. 
Had he overheard her talking to Min? As much as she often wished for a better life, she could not very well admit that to a stranger. There are ways out of servitude, he said, in barely more than a whisper. It is unfortunate our lords don't always see eye to eye. The general, for his part, is always kind to those who serve him well. Can you say the same for your lord, Cho? Of course, she lied. While few would ever accuse her lord of kindness, she was not about to criticize him in front of a stranger. She had no desire to lose her head. If he is so kind, he would not object to your accepting a gift, he said. He procured a small white flower from his pocket. A lovely thing, the day o' lily, to be admired. But have a care with it. The prettiest things are often the most deadly. As a seeming afterthought, he added, what does your lord like in his tea? Congratulations, Chris. Now we turn to the Creative Nonfiction Awards. The title sponsor of this category is a collection of community individuals and businesses who came together in support of the PEI Writers Guild. We would like to formally thank Arisha Dewidiak, Joel Gillespie, Julia Ann McKillian, McK McKinnon Gillian, Michael and Wendy Drake, Oliver Batchilder, and Jay's Plumbing and Heating. And the nominees are Ivy Wigmore for Namaste Squirrel. Kelly Kieran Sampson for Tears at a Funeral. Mark Enman for The Ballad of Dawn and Bev. Matthew Sherman for Brick. And Samantha Desjardins, Joyce, for Nalda's Way. Third prize, sponsored by Lori Brinklow, goes to Mark Enman for The Ballad of Dawn and Bev. If here's what the jurors had to say about The Ballad of Dawn and Bev, that this story evokes strong emotion without being overly emotional. While the narrative conveys the helplessness at the inevitable profession of a disease, the writer provides light, gentle humor through moments of recognition. Second prize, sponsored by Upstreet Craft Brewing, goes to Samantha Desjardins Joyce for Nalda's Way. Here, the jurors' comments were that the piece is both succinct and evocative through a few well-chosen words. The juror got a strong sense of Nalda. She could almost, or the juror could almost smell her. The writer constructs a story where the reader is both in the memory and in the moment. First prize, sponsored by the Provincial Credit Union, goes to Ivy Wigmore for Namaste Squirrel. Congratulations, Ivy, and the thoughts from the jurors as that the opening is strong, immediately situating the reader in the writer's world. The narrative invites the reader to reflect upon and make meaning of the symbols. It's a thoughtful, considered, and clearly articulated piece which works as story and as meditation. So congratulations, Ivy, again. And now, here's Ivy herself reading an excerpt from Namaste Squirrel. There's an opening just here, onto the path that winds down through the woods through the harbor. And as you enter the woods, you enter another world. On the path, we are surrounded by spirits walking with us from one world or another. The worlds of the past, of some time, of not yet or never to be. The clear, wild spirits of rock and tree Fox and salamander, gull and squirrel, the myriad tiny beings in the earth and the air and the water. As you watch, the night sky feathers and takes wing and just like that becomes crow. Ambassador of the shadow world, strutting the borderline between known and unknown, seen and unseen. He dips into one from the other, transporting scraps and talismans to inform us, guide us on our way, or maybe mislead us, depending on his mood and how you strike him. Crow is a trickster. He might bring you a gift. He might steal your lunch. 
In spring, there are thawing scents of cold, wet mud, worms turning the soil and nudging up the first green shoots. Sparrows and starlings and red-winged blackbirds sing ecstatically from their spring repertoire. The summer path is warm underfoot, evergreen needles soft and ripening, the green perfume that in fall becomes incense, apples, and wood smoke. The final plunges into cold blue water, the chill in the air, and the fire that warms us back on shore. It was lovely. But we turn now to the Marie uh, Coyote Blanc Award for Indigenous Writing, which is supported by Acorn Press and acknowledges the important contribution made to the PEI literary culture by Indigenous writers. The prize is open to PEI residents who are of Aboriginal descent, who identify as Aboriginal Islanders, and who are accepted as such by the communities in which they live. The prize is designed to recognize literary merit and promote works in all categories, including fiction, nonfiction, poetry, writing for children and young adults, plays, and script writing. And the nominees are Michael Sima for Straight Arrow, The Rise of Red Hawk, and Richard Pelissier Lush for Melkitai, I Am Brave. And this year's Marie Coyote Blanc Award for Indigenous Writing goes to Richard Pelissier Lush for Melkitai, I Am Brave. Congratulations. Here's what the judges had to say. Great teaching story. The writer has a talent for storytelling. The story made us want to hear more. As Mi'kmaq readers and listeners, we were able to relate to the story and believe it has great cultural importance. Reading the story was like listening to the elders speak when sitting around a fire. This story is important to help audience find strength. It was also intriguing to see how the ending could allow for different interpretations and can create discussion within a group setting. Congratulations, Richard. And now here's Richard himself reading an excerpt from Melkitai, I Am Brave. There was my best friend and brother, Alup Minibu, flying with his arms moving up and down as if they were wings of an eagle, a great gipu, flying with no care, no sadness, no fear, just flying. I knew exactly where he was at that moment. I watched him be free. I slowly walked up to Al and he stopped moving his arms. He looked at me. His eyes were different now. His face had visibly changed to look years older and his warm smile no longer existed. I started talking to a loop, but the words were coming out so fast that I was scrambling all my words and not making any sense, but he stopped me and he gave me the tightest hug I could ever ask for. I felt his pain. I felt his sorrow. I felt all the emotions during that hug and I began to cry on his shoulder. Al faced me again and said, there's no need to cry, my brother. I am still with her. My mother has traveled a moment you die with me. She is there now smiling and telling me to be brave. I looked at Al through tears and said, I want to be there with you both. And his eyes lowered to the ground. My brother, Mongidai is not a place you should wish to visit anymore. It is dark, full of fear and pain now. My mother has become that light I talked to you about for so many years. She's the only thing that is good about that world now. I no longer fear her light, my brother, but I too will be a light in that world one day. And our lights will shine so bright that it will save you and so many other lost souls. But most importantly, it will save Mongidai. Then, my brother, we'll be safe to return to our sanctuary again. Al then left our embrace and began walking back to the funeral home. Once he opened the door, he stopped and turned his head to look at me and said, There is a new light appearing in Mongidai these days. We will meet again soon, my brother, the Moltes, until we meet again. I stood there trying to figure out what Al meant about him becoming a light in Mongidai, and now this new light appearing. I became so worried about my best friend. And now he has left me all alone. Our next award is the Champion of Reading Award. This award, sponsored by the Bookmark, recognizes an individual in the community who champions reading as being essential to the quality of our lives and to our ability to take our place on the world stage. General Public was invited to submit champions from their communities for this award. Here's the video submission we received telling you all about the 2020 Champion of Reading Award recipient. 
and Jillian Mann for this year's Champion of Reading Award. She's a wonderful full-time librarian at the Confederation Center Public Library. She has enthusiasm for not just um, the book form of literature, but she loves theater and comic books, cinema, and music. She knows so much. She's constantly an avid learner, taking further courses in librarian studies, as well as um, making her French better all the time at College L'Acadie. Jill is the most inspired and enthusiastic librarian. We love to see her and all her recommendations and take it to heart. We recommend her highly for this award. Thank you. If there's one person who deserves this award, it's Jillian Main. I recommend Jill for the Champion of Reading Award. I think she's fantastic and uh, really promotes reading in our family and in our lives too. And the community at large. Thanks very much, Jill. Bye bye. Huge congratulations to Jilly Mann for this year's Champion of Reading Award recipient. From all of us, thank you for everything that you do. Yay. Uh, the UPEI Richard Gould Award is made possible through a generous endowment by the late Richard Gould and his wife, the late Hilda Woolno, and is awarded to a full-time UPEI student for excellence in creative writing. The recipient is chosen by the UPEI Department of English on the advice of those departmental members associated with the creative writing program. Let's watch Richard Lem as he reveals this year's Richard Gould Award for Creative Writing on behalf of UPEI. Monica Stewart is the recipient of this year's UPEI Richard Gould Award for Creative Writing. Named in honor of Professor Richard Gould, a founder of the island's literary writing and publishing realm, the award recognizes outstanding achievement in creative writing by a UPEI student. The award was endowed by Richard's wife, Hilda Wolno, a visual artist and, along with Richard, a groundbreaking arts activist in PEI. During her years at UPEI, Monica has applied herself with passionate discipline to the craft of poetry and the art of memoir writing. She has nurtured her promising talent in both genres with devoted reading and rigorous study of other writers. She writes with candor, humor, and captivating detail about familiar rites of passage of adolescence and adulthood. The temptations, travails, life lessons, and bittersweet delights. She also writes with hard-hitting honesty about the malevolence some people inflict on others, including the young and vulnerable, and about the lingering traumatic aftermath. Yet the light she shines on dreadful experiences is refracted to the prism of artistic technique and the stained glass window of her compassionate heart. Many previous Ghoul Award winners have since become published authors. Monica Stewart has the gift, desire, and dedication to join their ranks. Hey, congratulations, Monica, for this year's Richard Gould Award for Creative Writing. We turn now to the jo Joseph Sherman Award, which is named after Joe Sherman, an award-winning Charlottetown poet, columnist, curator, editor, and member of the Order of Canada who passed away in 2006. The award recognizes the exceptional contribution to the literary arts by someone who is not a prominent figure in literary production. Let's watch Deirdre Kessler as she reveals this year's Joseph Sherman Award recipient. Okay, Hello to everyone. <laughs> 2020 Island Literary Awards, first on record to be online totally. A pleasure it is to announce that Dan and Marlene McDonald are the award winners of the Joseph Sherman Award this year for their contribution to the literary arts on Prince Edward Island. Dan and Marlene, this award recognizes your significant work in developing and sustaining and promoting island literature and island literary groups and everything to do with books and reading. 
including all of the bookmark literary readings, um, the book launches, the Redarity series that you began. You, you started this amazing series on re readers and writing, the Redarity series. You brought the bookshop band from England to, perf um, to perform uh, uh, for us. You also commissioned the bookshop band to write a special video for Margaret Atwood. They made a video of it and it was presented at that little reading. I say little, were there 512 people at the Margaret Atwood reading? And at the end, the world premiere of a bookshop band video to one of her that they wrote in honor of Atwood. She was very pleased. Um, all sorts of activities that you sponsor through Bookmark. Uh, of course, the bookshop is pretty central to all you do. It's a place that we consider the heart of Charlottetown. Some of us feel so that's the crossroads. Meet you at the Bookmark. Um, we know, Marlene, that you do those windows, those fabulous windows. I know that. Um, the bookshop is a visual tree of the, the windows and inside and then all the little things that you bring in. Pens, drawing materials and books and you stock island books and you like island authors. During this COVID-19 lockdown, guess what this bookmark did for us? We could order books online or on the telephone and I think it was mostly Lori but I think perhaps Dan and Marlene, you may have delivered books to our doorsteps. Who does that? Congratulations on the Joseph Sherman Award, and we love you. Congratulations, Dan and Marlene. Congratulations, Dan and Marlene, for this year's Joseph Sherman Award recipients. From all of us, thank you for all you do for both writers and islanders. And now our last presentation of the evening, the award for distinguished contribution to the literary arts of PEI. This award recognizes Islanders who have made outstanding contributions over a sizable number of years through a substantial and esteemed record of publications and or significant work in developing, sustaining and promoting the island literary community. Let's watch Lori Brinklow and Hugh McDonald as they reveal this year's distinguished contribution to the literary arts recipients. Huey and I are thrilled to be paying tribute today to the recipients of this year's award for distinguished contribution to the literary arts on Prince Edward Island, Rob McLean and Melissa Mullen. For over 30 years, both National Theatre School graduates have been known to island audiences as actors, performing on stage around PEI and the Maritimes but they're just as prolific behind the scenes as writers bringing to the stage many of the island's stories that otherwise might be forgotten. But did you also know that Rob and Melissa have been partners for many years too, as farmers, co-producers, spouses, and parents? After all of that togetherness, they still talk to one another. <laughs> Their latest writing adventure, and one that is close to my heart, is The Man Who Saved the Songs based on the books, journals, and interviews of Dr. Edward Sandy Ives from Orono, Maine, the play chronicles Ives' first travels to PEI in the 1950s as a budding folklorist in his quest to save from oblivion the work of notorious Time Valley songmaker Larry Gorman. The legend goes, if Gorman didn't like you or something you did, he'd get even and song you. This project was instigated by their Homestead Players collaborator, the late Harry Baglow, who, along with the rest of us at the Institute of Island Studies, staged the Larry Gorman Folk Festival in Tyne Valley over several summers. And by the way, Harry is a recipient of this award too. Sandy Ives and his beloved wife, Bobby, were always the guests of honor. I count myself so fortunate to have been able to be part of those halcyon days and got to relive some of the memories at the Georgetown Playhouse last fall when Rob and Melissa did a run through of the play. Believe me, when we're finally allowed back into theaters, it's going to be fantastic. 
The Homestead Players, originally formed to adapt Sir Andrew McPhail's The Master's Wife for the stage during PEI's 2014 celebration year. The play is based on a book of the same name and has its roots in the McPhail homestead in Orwell. The show toured PEI to sold out crowds and received a Heritage Award from the PEI Museum, Museum and Heritage Foundation. Rob and Melissa also co-wrote the short play, Dear Mr. Keith, produced by Theatre Yes in Edmonton and Magnetic North Theatre Fest in Halifax. And they have per, uh, presented staged readings from former PEI Premier Angus McLean's memoir, Making It Home, which tells the impressive story of Rob's father's evasion from Nazi-occupied Europe. I have known and admired Rob for a long time and first set eyes on Melissa as she played the role of a farm wife on the stage of the Georgetown Playhouse many years past. I've never forgotten her outstanding performance. She and Rob often accompanied Gwen, Rob's gracious and intelligent mother, from their home in Lewis to the Sunday service at the church where Sandra and I have sung in choir for decades. Their arrival among us led to a flourish of theater in the church basement, directed by Melissa, and dinner theaters full of humor and music, written, directed, and produced by the two of them. Melissa remains an energetic volunteer and inspiration to us in so many other ways. Rob is a former artistic director of Theater PEI, for which he directed and developed new scripts. Melissa, an accomplished writer, is currently working on a new script titled Continuing Care. Together, they brought authentic PEI to the forefront of the island. The work of Sandy Ives, the stories of Sir Andrew McPhail, the life and music of Stomp and Tom, and they continue the important work of Ron Irving and Elizabeth Muir and others as Rob, Rob as director of Theatre PEI. Congratulations, Rob and Melissa. On behalf of the whole island, we thank you for contributing to our rich cultural tapestry by giving voice to our storied past, all the while making it such an enjoyable experience. You are both a true gift to our island. Sending big virtual hugs to you both. Congratulations, Rob and Melissa. Yay, congratulations, Rob and Melissa. That's such a, that was such a lovely dedication. And congratulations to all of the winners this year. I can only hope this will inspire each of you to keep writing and crafting the stories that will shape PEI's literary future. Also, a big thank you to our supporters and sponsors, the ILA committee and everyone who supported the awards. A special thank you to our, co to our coordinator, Christian Gallant, for his guidance and for braving leading the charge on, in this new online format. These awards keep growing year after year, so we'd love to encourage each of you watching to take part next year in the 34th Annual Island Literary Awards. If you're interested in writing or in being part of the literary community here on PEI, join us, peiwritersguild.com, and check out more of our work there. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Christine and Mark, for joining us, and have a great night. Congratulations, everybody. Keep on writing. <laughs>